Chef Marcel Bienvenu is an instructor at the Chef John Foles Culinary Institute at Nickel State University. Her professional experience includes Commander's Palace in New Orleans, Brennan's of Houston, working with Chef Paul Prudhomme, and Chef Emeril Lagasse. Additionally, Chef Marcel wrote the Cooking Creole column for the Times-Picayune for 32 years, nominated for the James Beard Award for American Cookbooks, and was also inducted into the Acadian Museum of Living Legends. And she's one of my favorite teachers ever. So welcome, Chef. How are you? Welcome. Thank you. Lovely here. Good deal. So we are going to chat today. I'm excited to do this. For listeners, I went to the Chef John Foles Culinary Institute, graduated in 2010. And in my senior year, we were all gathered together and told that they had been working on this new instructor who was coming in. And she was a female and she was a food writer. And we were going to be just very, very excited about it. And they announced you and you came in and I was the one person in the group because I went to school as a 40-year-old among 19 and 20-year-olds. I was the only person applauding and I was delighted to be there with you because I grew up in Laplace, so we got the Times-Picayune and Thursdays there was a fight between me and my sister over who read the food section first. And I was actually recently going through my mom's recipes. She typed up recipes on three by five cards on a typewriter, and we're organizing them and going to print a family cookbook. But she also saved clippings. And so lots and lots of your column was in there, clippings that she would pin on a bulletin board. It was the Pinterest of the day, saving your column. So it was very, very special to me to learn from you at Nichols. And I was so excited when you came to work there. And so now you've been there, is it 10 years now? Ten years, yeah. And one of my fondest memories of your classes, and you teach lots of fundamental classes there, but you also taught me how to write a recipe. And that was huge for me. And something I learned about you is I knew you wrote the food column, and I knew you edited cookbooks and you had your own cookbooks, but I didn't realize your start was in journalism and that your start in journalism wasn't necessarily in food. And that you have a long legacy of journalists in your family. Right. My family owned the the Tesh News, which was established in 1886 by my grandfather. And uh, it's still in operation today. And so after uh, Papa Isaiah died, my father took it over. And then my brother did in the clay. And now he just retired. So Mm -hmm. it's been in the family. We grew up with the printing presses and all that. You got your first job in journalism with the Picayune? Yes. My father said, well, just go ask him for a job. And I said, well, Dad, I just can't walk in there. And he said, well, just go ahead. Well, at the time, I was married to this guy that we don't talk about too much, but his name was N.O. Wright, W-R-I-G-H-T. Gotcha. So my name was Marcel B. Wright. Well, it turned out to be very wrong. <laughs> but uh, I went there, and I didn't use the internet. I used my married name. And after about three months, Mr. Uh, Healy, who was the editor, called me and he says, Marcel, what's your last name? I said, Bienvenue. He said, well, you know, I wrote out the 1927 flood with your father on the roof of a building in St. Martinville. I said, I know, we have that picture. And so he said, well, change your name. I said, not only that, I'm going to change husband. He made me use Bienvenue. So we kept in touch even after I left the picking the first time. And then in 1984, Ella Brennan, who had become a mentor to me, said, well, why don't you just write for the Times Picayune? and I'll just call him up and say you want to write now. I said, oh, okay. And she did. <laughs> you did go into straight into food writing at that point? In 1972, I was working at the Picayune, and, and the Time Life of Book people were starting their Foods of the World series. And they had come to the Times Picayune, and they got their writers' deadline. And the city editor said, Marcel, would we take these people for coffee? They want, they're from Time Life. They want something. So I went and took them for coffee. And one of the people there was this Brasher. And her father at the time was, I think, the dean of men at LSU. So we got, you know, became good friends. And at the age of 23 or 24, I convinced her that I knew everything there was to know about Louisiana food. And she hired me as a research director. And that was when I really realized that I was living in a place that food was just different than any place else. And I was very curious about the history. Why did we eat gumbo? Why did we have gumbo? And my father was an old Boy Scout leader, and he took me everywhere. I mean, I learned to cook at his elbow. He was one of those that don't let the truth get in the way of a good story. 
So I kind of followed him around, and he loved cooking outdoors. And so when I went to work with Tom Life and we finished that, then Al Brenner and I became big buddies. And I went to work there in the 70s, and that's how it all happened. So the food column, the food issue, it's a food section. It was the Thursday food section. That's how I remember it growing up. That started in the 80s? In 84. I had just closed my restaurant in Lafayette. Okay. So I heard that from New Orleans looking for a job at Ellicott. I'm going to call the town sick and start writing for them. And she kind of really finagled that. And when I went for an interview, I said, I always write in the first person. So he said, that's fine. You tell stories about your family. And that's really how it started. Well, and they say marketing is storytelling. We were talking about that the other day. You wrote your final column in 2016, correct? Yes, Christmas of 60, yeah. So talk a little bit about the evolution of the changes to that column and section from 84 to 2016. In terms of the food, think about what you were writing then versus the last column. The thing, too, that I started realizing was in the 70s, when Paul Proudhon first appeared on the culinary scene in New Orleans, I think everybody just went, whoa. And he was such a dynamic, creative person that I thought it was just absolutely incredible to watch him do an interpretation of what Cajun food was. You know, my idea of Cajun food was rice and gravy, baked sweet potatoes, smothered everything, wild ducks brought by daddy and fish from the, from the basin. And he had these incredibly creative things. Of, you know, he made a little a pea rug out of an eggplant or a merleton. I remember that. Fry it. Then he filled the little pea rug with fried oysters and fried shrimp and then put a hollandaise sauce flavored with tasso. And I went, well, I didn't have that at my mama's house. <laughs> Nobody even knew what tasso was at that time. Or boudin, or andouille. A lot of people outside South Louisiana had no idea what that was. When I saw him go to work for Ella, I said, Ella, nobody's going to eat Cajun food. I said, there's hardly any place at that time that you could get a chicken and sausage gumbo in the city. And I said, you know, the little Cajuns cook their gumbo with chicken on the bone. Oh, she said, well, don't worry about that. We'll just take it off the bone. That was so simple. And it was really interesting to see she and Paul marry the two together. And it became almost kind of another cuisine. It was a really drastic change from seeing country food changing to things that people in the city would eat. And that was an evolutionary time. I mean, up until the 50s and late 60s, everybody was eating American food. I mean, generally. And then everybody thought, oh, well, look, Paul Prudhomme has this Cajun food. And it went wild. Everybody went crazy. He introduced all these flavors, and at first everybody went, well, he, he just put pepper on it. But it was much more intricate than that. So when I started writing in 84, that wave had kind of really hit, especially in New Orleans. A lot of the chefs were becoming very cutting edge of changing to using food from the farmers. Paul would have, a, I think every Wednesday they'd get a little bit of pig to the restaurant and take it apart and cook it to do all kinds of things. So it was kind of interesting to see people change what they were looking for. Also, New Orleans had the great respect for the culture. I could kind of jump back and forth writing about old traditional stuff. Like I remember the first three or four recipes columns, I went, Mom, Mom, I want to want I said, well, tell them how to make griots and grits. Or let's tell them how to make chicken or gros oignons, which was chicken smothered with onions. So I kind of started using things in my family that we ate. But of course, then I became, I started being in the city longer, more, and I was watching what was going on. So it just kind of changed. It just kind of grew with what was popular and what was coming into being very popular in the South. And I still think some people do not understand South Louisiana food. I still think they think that if you put pepper on it, it's Cajun. Oh, I 100% agree. And when I see Cajun French fries, oh, okay, it has cayenne pepper on it, I guess. A Cajun pizza. Why would we want to make something Italian Cajun? <laughs> and what would make it Cajun? Everybody trying to climb on this Cajun boat and having people try to understand what it was. And I think it's either sort of cartoonish and like a sitcom, everything's Cajun or the mashup of Cajun Creole, but I get a lot of people who think that Cajun food is sort of lowbrow and peasant food and Creole food is more city food and more sophisticated. And when you really start to look at it and read about the culture, Cajun food is a very complex cuisine. It does have its French base. That's who settled in, in the south of Louisiana. The French were here first. Well, the 
the American Indians were here first, but they also contributed to what eventually we became knowing what was in these dishes. So it's very, you know, the Italians, the Germans, the uh, French, the uh, African Americans, everybody had their hand in the pot. Exactly. And and when Emerald said he wanted to do a book on just Louisiana, I went, mm-hmm, okay. So he, he came out with this Louisiana Real and Rustic. And he and my mom would talk for hours. And he'd say, where's that Cajun of Creole? She says, uh, I don't know. I think it's just what we, you know, it all depends on who's cooking it. You know, who is stirring the pot? And Emerald was very good about that first book. Well, that was not really his first book, but the second book. Uh, Louisiana Real and Rustic. He, said, I'm tra- he was very, very adamant about learning and trying to keep the Acadian cuisine kind of true. Mm-hmm. And we roamed all over South Louisiana. We got on a shrimp boat. We got on oyster boat. We went duck hunting. We went. We went. To, we talked to people on the side of the road who was fishing. You know, where he was just very good about doing all this. So I said, "You're not doing anything fancy. This is home cooking." And he captured it very well. I mean, people, and that's what really kind of started his live show. What I think is really interesting about your how many books? My, I've written four books. I've worked on seven of his books, and I've worked on some with McElhaney. So it's a total of 17 books mm-hmm. I've worked. And, and then The Cooking of the Storm, which was the one that we did after Katrina, that I did with the Times Union that was nominated to the James Spirit Award, which I think is one of the brilliant ideas for a book after the storm. Oh, without a doubt. I want to get to that. But it's interesting to me because you have a list of cookbooks that you've written, but you also have a list of historical texts, basically, you know, stir the pot was my text for the class I took with you at Nichols. Talk about what would be your big teachable takeaway from writing a cookbook versus, say, writing one of these texts. Well, the two Dr. Brasso's that I worked with on stir the pot, the, the, the father, Dr. Brasso, had worked with the uh, Louisiana Studies. I'm never going to get it right. But anyway, he had access to a great wealth of uh, Louisiana history at uh, U.S. which was USL then, and that started this Louisiana historic whatever it is. And you know, when I started working with him, I was flabbergasted about all the history that pertained to the cuisine, and that's what really had ignited me. I'd worked in Washington D.C. In, in the '60s, and I called home after a week. I said, "Mom, I have to come home. They don't have gumbo here." <laughs> and you know, she said, "Oh well, you, you, it's going to be okay. Call your congressman; he'll get some shrimp sent up to y'all." Anyway. <laughs> Uh, when I realized people didn't eat like we did, I never thought of you know, how I'm going to go find out why they did. So when I was working with the Brasso's, we really got into how things started to develop when the Acadians got here from Canada. And I'm sure they went and they went, where are we? You know, the, the climate was different. They had to make do with, with uh, ingredients they had never seen before. And again, it was kind of a, a trading back and forth with American Indians with the French that were here. They got here in the 1750s. By the late 1700s, we had the French Revolution, which brought a whole other wave of French aristocrats. Also in the late 1700s was when they had the slave uprising in the Caribbean. So there was another influx of something that was going to also contribute to the evolution of what eventually became what we know now. It, it, was, it, was, it was mind-boggling to me. I, I, we can't get away from this interview without, and I know you've been asked this a ton of times, but I, I know I get asked it often, and I know listeners are going to want to know. Tell us what your definition of the difference, what is the difference between Cajun food versus Creole food? It's the difference between rustic Cajun to very sophisticated. Let me just give you an example. Madam X, who lives, Madame X, who lives in the French Quarter in New Orleans. And she's having a very nice dinner party. She and her cook go to the market. They get all their fresh ingredients. She has set a beautiful table with china and crystal. You know, the table is set beautifully. They have a five or six course dinner. And it's all very elegant and very, very French with some Spanish in, in it. When you go to, to the country, Madame Y is standing at her back porch and whatever flies, crawls, or, or comes across her backyard is what's going in the pot. <laughs> And, you know, it may be 20 people coming to eat because the cousins are coming next door. Or on Sundays, my mother would say, oh, I have to make a long gravy. Taunt and I just stopped by and cousin so 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 get to kind of stretch. So everything was in a big pot. The only common thing that was always on the stove every day of my life was a pot of rice. Same here. Whether you needed it or not, it was there. 
Yeah, one of the first things I learned how to cook. Yeah, I mean, you know, and if they had leftovers, they made it into pudding. It was like leftover bread made into French bread. So it was a very rustic, very, very casual kind of food. It was whoever, you know, whatever your husband brought back from the hunt, whatever they caught fishing, whatever you could grow in the backyard. So, you know, that was when food farm to table was at its best. Right. And now it's a trendy thing. We all talk about doing like it's new and it's just how they lived. And I will say this, this one more thing, because I had a student ask me a couple after days, but you know, Chef, uh, the desserts weren't real fancy. I feel they didn't have any fancy or exotic ingredients. They had chicken, so they had eggs. We had cows, so we had milk. We had sugar cane farmers, so we had sugar. You know, so it was, you know, you had bread pudding. You had gato cito, syrup cake. You had les oreilles de cochon, the little pig's ears that made out of pastry. And it was all very simple little things because that's all they had. You know, we didn't have chocolate and all that. You know, so it was very humble, humble ingredients. Everything we've been talking about and definitely everything you've written about is all in an effort to connect the cuisine with the culture. Yes, and you know, and I tell these students, and I teach them that culinary history of the South, I want them to realize that, that their background, their culture, their family ties, I've really impressed upon them to try to keep that preserved. You know, one of them told me the other day, said, oh, I, I don't make them alive unless I have a box of it. And I said, but you know, you're missing the whole point, because some of these dishes, like gumbo and jambalaya, takes a couple hours to fix. You have to chop, and you know. Sometimes you have to go catch your shrimp or whatever, and uh, or make your own sauce. And I said, you're missing the point of the family and friends being together in the kitchen and sharing the preparation of this food. And that's how our culture and our food ways continue to live. Because if everybody made something out of box, what, what's fun about that? Exactly. And so that all goes to that preservation. And this is a perfect time to talk about, I really want to talk about after the storm. Because that was really, really an effort in preservation at a time when we didn't know what what was going to happen. There were so many questions. I had family members who were who were displaced, and I remember when that came out. That was such a treat for my family to all go out and buy a copy of that book. So tell me how um, you and Judy made that come together. When we started finally getting back to the city. We started having all these letters, and people would drop off notes to the Constitution and say, I can't buy, you know, everything had been, the cookbooks floated away, the recipe boxes floated away. And the first thing people wanted to know in New Orleans was, I'm hungry, and I want my comfort food. Mm -hmm. And I want to talk about my recipes for stuffed merleton. And what happened then was that Judy really was great about, if I had a recipe you wanted, she would hook you up with the person that you wanted the recipe from. So we started this big connection. Exchange Alley is what she called. You know, we, we just all, she started a new column. So I remember this man came. He, he had a whole box of, of recipes. He said, these were in my attic, so they didn't get... So he just dumped them off. <laughs> and we just started this big thing about trying to get people... Re and but, but we first realized that a lot of people were looking for the old recipes or recipes from restaurants that were no longer there, that had, that had gone away. So it was, And then, of course, the younger people wanted stuff that they knew about. So it was a really incredible project to get the balance of the recipes that we thought should be included. And we had access to the Louisiana Library. They have a huge database. I mean, you could literally put in Arsons Rockefeller, and you'd come up with 10 recipes. And everything that was in the major papers in Louisiana. So we had to kind of hunt and find one that was really, you know, like, um, this was easy, but you know, we want the recipe from the Roosevelt for the milk punches or whatever, or the gin fizzle. And, you know, it was all, it was all in, in the picking. And thank God that their library had survived without much damage. So we were able to go down that find original recipes that were in the paper. And it was really, a, it, was a, it was a great community effort. And, you know, people were really, I think the first rooms people wanted in their house was their kitchen. Oh, n no doubt. They, uh, they don't need a bathroom, but they needed a kitchen. Well, and one of the first things we wanted to do was just gather for a meal. It's what you do in a time of crisis like that. And, you know, I think Judy and I were on um, PBS or whatever. I can't remember the interview. She says, why do you think people are so interested? I said, well, that's what their comfort. People in Louisiana live by their food tradition. But if this happened in Utah, nobody would have called and said, can you 
give me El Tonto Nana's recipe for the stuffed Muruto. I'm, <laughs> I'm not making fun of people in Utah. I don't know what they eat, but I don't think they have the, um, the association with food being such comfort. And I think that, you know, when the book came out, I mean, we, the first day that they came out, we had 6,000 free orders. And Judy and I signed each one of those books. They, it took us two days. Oh, wow. My hands, swell, our hands were swelling up from, from mm-hmm. writing. And it was just such an outpouring of people that so, well, appreciated the fact that we had gathered all this stuff together and they could, you know, kind of put away their poor cookbooks that had been drenched and full of mold. Exactly. So they had something to fall back on. In that way, you did the preservation for them. Yes. I want to talk a little bit about your 10 years in academia since you've been at Nichols, because it was such a huge part for me that you were one of my teachers. And one of the things you teach, which is something that I, uh, is so important to me, is writing. And talk a little bit about how you approach writing with the students, because I wonder if a lot of them initially make the connection with, I'm going to go be a chef, but I should also be a good writer. Well, I've been teaching the culinary history of the South since I started there, and I do it online. So, and it, it's not just a culinary uh, class. It can be uh, humanities, I believe, and history. So I have football players, and I have biologists, and I have culinary students, and I have nursing students. It's a, and the great thing about it is they can't see me, and I can't see them. So mm-hmm. I think they, they go, oh, but you, nobody knows who I am. And we have these great weekly discussions. And they have to write these discussions. On Google. And one of the research papers I'm still making them do, which I think kind of really brings them to kind of a reality, is I come to go find an old person and find out their family's food ways and their culture back maybe in the 50s, or maybe they have somebody in the 40s and 50s, and how things have changed from then to now. I mean, one little girl came to the other day and said, I never asked my grandma about anything. And the other day I sat with her and talked about when she was a little girl. And that's how history, that's how culture. I remember I had one student who came to the office and said, I don't know any old people. I'm from Mississippi and I don't know nothing. So I said, well, you know what's that? We're going to go to the nursing home. And I called the nursing home. We're going to find you a pal. We did. I missed that. I forget his name. And you're going to interview him and you're going to play like that's your grandmother, grandfather, or whatever. And for two years, Zach went every Friday to visit that gentleman in the nursing home. He was fascinated by hearing these guys talk about how they used to, you know, milk cows, make ice cream, make make their own butter. And I make some of my students make butter the first day of class with, you know, with the cream. And they go, what is this? It's butter. Because I don't think they ever saw anybody make butter. <laughs> That's funny. <laughs> and, uh, you know, so I make them write about chefs that have tried to preserve our Southern heritage. It doesn't have to be from Louisiana. But, you know, I think the cuisine of the South is a very humble cuisine. I mean, you know, I remember when I was writing some things for Emma, and one time I sent up a recipe to New York City with grits. And the little editor called said, oh, ma'am, we don't write any recipes with grits. That's only for poor people. And I went, oh, what? Now, I bet you no chef work his salt does not have a recipe with, you know, a thing, an item on his menu without grits. Oh, without a doubt. I mean, you know, so it was, it's very interesting to see how that evolution kind of just starts revolving around. Ella Brennan used to say, we may evolve, we may grow, but we'll always go back to choose to say, what's wrong with a wonderful stuffed flounder? And now we can't find it on any menu. And that was on everybody's menu. And it's not that I don't want our, cuisine to grow and to come, you know, love creativity. But I don't want them to stray too far from what is real and what's tradition. And you know, my students, <laughs> some of them can't write, but they like to tell stories. And that's that's the whole thing about writing. You're telling a story. And I started developing a culinary journalism class with the mass media people on campus. And that's also becoming one of my fun classes. You know, we learn how to blog, we learn how to write recipes, we learn how to take pictures of food, we learn how to do restaurant reviews. Because if you go to any kind of food-oriented website, somebody's out there cooking and taking the pictures and all that. And I have two or three students that are now working in Birmingham. with It's now the mecca for food magazines. So there is a career path in that these days. Without a doubt, my social media manager said I could write a recipe a day and put it on our website and it wouldn't be enough. The consumption of content 
is just voracious. It's just really, really fast. And so being able to put out good, solid content, you know, a lot of it gets repetitive, but the bottom line is that's just how we consume now. So being able to put out good, solid content quickly is really, really important. I'm a perfectionist, so I'm editing for two and three days. And she's like, well, we got to get it out there. Just feel confident in your writing. So I think it's great what you're doing because it is such a big part of the food world now. It is. And I like to think that all of our students that come through Nichols, that we find a place for them. I had a student, and after the third block, I said, honey, you don't like to cook? She said, well, I like to cook, but I don't like to be in the kitchen all the time. I said, well, what are you, what are you going to do? She said, I don't know. But she wrote a paper for me that was hysterical. It was the cutest, funnest thing about she and the sister who had to come home by themselves when they were like fifth or sixth grade. And they were always hungry, so they would fix something. And, you know, sometimes one time they almost set the place on fire, but they started to learn to cook. And she wrote beautifully. And now she's writing for the blog in Atlanta. I think they have in Atlanta. There's one in Birmingham. There's one in Savannah. And she's having a ball. And she doesn't have to stay in the kitchen all day long cooking. I knew that she yeah. liked food, but she didn't want to have to cook it in a restaurant. Or, you know, she wanted something else. And I knew that was, there's got to be a place for her. I love that. This is a perfect spot to talk about Nichols and what you guys do there. Of course, I'm a fan. I'm an alum. I'm a fan. I do have a lot of parents come to me and have a graduating senior who wants to go go to culinary school, and they look at schools across the country and ask me my opinion. And of course, I always sing the praises of Nichols. But I'd love to get from your point of view what you think sets Nichols apart in terms of, you know, a parent looking at a culinary program for their teenager or someone out there looking to change careers, what do you think sets it apart? Well, I think that the chef down folks, I think that it's such a well-balanced program. And of course, too, some of the students would just take their associate's degree, which is fine. And, but a lot of them that take the four year and get their bachelor's science, they're way ahead of the game when it comes to getting jobs after graduation. And I wrote a little thing for incoming students, 101 jobs you can get with a culinary degree. And everybody went, are oh, you really pulling it? I said, I'm telling you, there's, there's that many jobs out there. And I think that with the bistro program, Chef Caston, Chef JP, Chef Amelie, uh, you know, these kids get to work front of the house, back of the house. And you probably would, would agree with me. You know, some of these kids, I'm not working front of the house. I'm not carrying a tray. I'm not talking to people. Well, half of them change their minds. They go, I'm not working in the kitchen. I'm staying in the trunk. Yep. Or vice versa. So they get, they get a really good um, exposure to, to real life. You know, they have to play in the menus. They have to do a requisition. They have to give positions in the kitchen. And, you know, we're sold out every semester for that bistro. I mean, I can't even get in sometimes. <laughs> I have eaten in the kitchen. But... Um, you know, then we, we have the baking. We have a new baking. Well, she's not new. She's out there. She is. Our baking classes are absolutely world class. And we have a gentleman, a chef from, um, well, he's really from Arkansas, but he's, I think he came to us from near Atlanta. And he does all our God Marger. I mean, we, they make sandwiches. They've been, I mean, the sausages. They've been uh, making all kinds of uh, pâtés and, you know, canning and, he, he has made them just go off the, the wall. It's bad. It's bad. And, you know, they have, they have soup stocks and sauces. And now they, we have concentrations, you know. After their second, second core uh, classes, we try to point them in a direction that they would like to do. And some of them encourage them to do externships. And, you know, some of them come back, Chef, I don't want to be in the catering business. Suppose you forgot the ketchup, you know, and you the, you know you're at a you're in the middle of a levee during a party for a hundred people. So they, you know, if they exposed to all that, they can make better judgment. You know what what they should do. Uh, and, you know, we and we try to teach them to all be managers to learn how to work with people. They take a lot of business classes. They take dietetics. They take nutrition. So you know they can do anything. Coupled with all of that is the the focus on Cajun Creole cuisine. I don't think any other culinary school approaches their regional cuisine the way that Nichols does. We have so much to offer in that. When you think about it, there's certainly uh, different kind of cuisines all over the United States and the world. And I think what people recognize, they're like, we, we are now getting students from away. And we had two students from North Carolina. And one of them said, I'm not leaving. She said, y'all have way too much fun here. And she said, I would never have thought of of food being so much part of the culture. And, I mean, it, food is part of the culture in, in many areas. 
but I, I think they see so much joy and so much attention, child food. It's so inspiring, I guess. I can't think mm-hmm. of another word. Um, you know, and I have this, we have another one that just came from Virginia. And the other day she said, Chip, is down the bayou a town? <laughs> <laughs> I said, why? She said, well, you ask people where they're from. They go, from down the bayou. <laughs> and <laughs> I don't know if everybody in your listeners will probably know what that is. But she just thought that was wonderful. Yeah. So, you know, they, and it is, even in, in little parts of South Louisiana, there's different food culture. When I worked at Oak Alley Plantation and found out that people had fried catfish and white beans and rice on Fridays, I went, what are they doing? And one of the cooks said, well, Miss Morrison, what do you eat with your fried fish? I said, we have potato salad. <laughs> well, yeah, so even this would be these little pockets uh, of the, you know, and it really kind of depends on who settled that area. It might have been the German, it might have been the Italian. It's just fascinating to me. You know, like if you ask somebody from down the body what they had when they were little, they go, we need spaghetti. I'm like, what's that? <laughs> and it was, I'm sure that came about during the Depression or World, during World War II, we had food rations. So they just had to make do with what they had. So they made roux spaghetti. Oh, absolutely. And I say you can go 10 miles and the roux is a completely different color. Absolutely. You're in two different worlds in terms of roux. I did a research program with 10 students two years ago on roux. And, you know, there's, I thought there was only one way to make roux. It was like my mother taught me, right? Mm-hmm. Right. That's the only way. Exactly. And then I found out, oh, well, there's, there's always, you can put more oil, you can put more flour, you mm-hmm. can get different colors. And we found that the further west you go of Lafayette, the darker the roof. And I think that's because of the German influence along the plains, the prairies. And mommy would say you have to have a lighter roof of seafood. Right. So having these 10, just these 10 students at Brain, well, I kind of wanted to know where they were from. Anybody north of Alexandria, I'm like, oh, this is going to be cool. That's a shade for <laughs> But, you know, it was very interesting to see them talk about the roof in their family and what they made with it. It's very curious, yeah. I teach cooking classes and it's home cooks. And it's fascinating to me that folks get to a certain station in life and they come in a class and I teach them something that I feel is very basic and it's like I split the atom. And I wonder, what have you been doing all these years? And you guys, you teach the fundamentals as well. So thinking about the home cook, what would be sort of your go-to fundamentals that a home cook should have under their belt? You know, th- this is a question because now I'm a great aunt, and I've seen my nieces and some of my nephews. They dust their pots. I don't. I said, do y'all know how to turn on the fire of the stove? Y'all no, have this four thousand million dollars stuff. And I think that some of these younger people have never sat around on a Sunday afternoon with their grandparents and aunts and uncles, so they're kind of afraid of it. So they really, and we have so much mm. stuff now in boxes and pre this and pre that. I always tell my one on one. If you can make chicken salad and you can cook bake a chicken, and if you can make just a simple, it can be a broth or stock based soup. Chef Randy always says that. And learn how to do two or three different kinds of potato dishes or rice dishes. But even now we have instant rice or something. I'm just, you know, I'm, right now I'm at a loss. But I think that basically people that really like to cook, like I have a sister who shouldn't cook. I mean, she, there's no way in the hell she can cook. I mean, she doesn't like it. And I think that some of these things have just not been around families that cook. It really makes me sad that they don't have that family connection, watching their their parents cook or grandparents. Anthony Bourdain equated being able to cook, even if it was just a handful of meals, to learning how to tie your shoes or getting potty trained. It's just, it should be that basic of a, a requirement of life to be able to know how to cook a couple of meals from scratch and maybe even invite some folks over and and feed them too. And I get that a lot, that folks just are, you know, I do something that I think is very basic and they are just minds blown over the basics. And Anne, don't you, I mean, we have access to the most incredible assortment of vegetables. You know, when I, I guess I'm really old. When I was little, we only had one kind of leather, <laughs> iceberg, iceberg, mm-hmm. iceberg. We have so many choices. I found two of my students the other day in front of a, a big display of box jambalaya. And one of them said, oh, Lord, don't, don't come, chef. You're not going to buy it. You're not going to buy it. We promise you're not buying it. You better not. I said, you can make better jambalaya with your simple recipe. It doesn't have to be the two-hour jambalaya. I can give you a recipe that you can make jambalaya in 30 minutes. And they went, oh, wow. I said, okay. 
And I said, you y'all need to really start paying attention to this. You're not going to be Emma Lagasse in two semesters. You have to learn the basics. You have to learn techniques. You have to learn how to boil, steam, and braise something or poach it. And, you know, they had me and, and Chef Randy at the same semester. He's doing all the proteins, and I'm doing all the fruits and vegetables and dairy products. So that gives them a real – in fact, now I, I, when I see them in the second and third block, I see them finally got it. It's not that they don't have the passion. They just have not been exposed. Right. They're, they're not exposed to it. It's not something that took place on a day-to-day like it did for us. I want to ask you one final question, and it's a question I ask a lot of people. If you had to teach a novice cook, not a culinary institute student, but a novice cook, one dish, what would it be? Well, you know, I, I think about when I went off on my own after college with Martha. My mother said, make sure you know how to make gumbo. Do not call me in the middle of the night and say, oh, Mom, how long do I have to cook the, this? She said, please don't call me after 8 o'clock and ask me how to do something after you've had two, you know, two beers or whatever. <laughs> and she also made me learn how to make stuffed bell peppers with seafood and or with ground beef. I knew how to bake a chicken. I knew how to bake the chicken beautifully. And I could use leftovers to make that chicken salad she always said we should learn. And I also think one-pot meals are so easy. Not, it's not that it, it's not easy. They, they pay off. You have a big pot of something and rice and a salad, you're good to go. Right. Red beans and rice, jambalaya. Yeah. My mother used to make, a t- some places they call it sticky chicken. It was like smothered chicken down. Mm-hmm. And you had rice and gravy with that. You had rice mm-hmm. and gravy with a uh, round steak. And you know, fresh vegetables are so simple now. I mean, you can get all this stuff at the farmer's market. I mean, Browse says all these big, bring all your money to Whole Foods and get the prettiest stuff you can find, <laughs> you know? But, you know, so you know, I, I think people want to do something too fancy in the beginning. There it, you it, go. Has, it has something you have to grow into. You have to polish your techniques. And, your, and you know, it also, too, depends on, on your family. I have a, a nephew. His wife dusts her pants. <laughs> <laughs> but he likes to cook. So on Sunday afternoons, it's a, it's a free-for-all. You know, his brothers and sisters, nieces and nephews, if I am out on the bound on Sunday afternoon, I know where to go because they're, they're cooking. And I think that's wonderful to see them do that. And I have two or three others. Um, uh, I have one little girl, one, one who's only 15 years old, and she's just hungry to learn to cook. You know, she'll come spend a couple of hours here, and she's happy as she can be. She just likes to be around that. And I do see that from the younger ones. It's almost like we're back on an uptick of learning. You know, my daughter taught herself how to sew. We're seeing a huge interest in canning, jams, jellies, pickling, that sort of thing. So perhaps we're back on an upswing with home cooking. Well, this has been fantastic. Thank you so much. We are going to link to all your cookbooks in the show notes and just want to put it out there. If you have any final thoughts that you want to share with our listeners, we'd love to hear that. I'll go back to what I was saying. Don't ask a relative for a recipe. Go cook it with them. Get in the kitchen. I used to laugh that we had a really great had a great aunt who was fabulous cook, and she would never tell us the whole recipe. Mm-hmm. Right before she died, Mama <laughs> said, we are going to the hospital, and she's going to tell us. And, and um, you know, I think that people need to be in the kitchen and watching a, a friend or a relative or somebody cook to watch what they do. Because sometimes I, I even do it, give a recipe to a child, and I say, oh, I forgot to tell them to do this. Do you really have to I said, follow somebody around in the kitchen and watch yeah. what they do? Yeah. You know? I love that. All right. Well, and thank be you. Proud of, be proud of it. Yeah. Okay. Thanks. Thank you, Chef. Okay. All right. Bye-bye. Bye. Bye.